We'll get started now with Future Proofing Now, the season two, episode two, AI and the new dimension of innovation. I'm excited to be here with our community manager, Joanne Lemkul, and my co-host and collaborator in crime in all things beyond innovation, Sean Moffitt. So Sean, uh, you excited about today's webcast? This is the most popular topic based on democratic will. So um, yeah, uh, the people want it, but we're giving it today. You asked for it, you got it. So in just a few minutes, we'll be bringing on a panel of many people, one at a time and a little bit of interaction as well. And you'll, you'll meet Kevin and Natana and Charles and Ben and Alex in just a moment. But first we'd like to kick it off with how AI is really relevant to what we're all interested about here in the world of future proofing. How have you been paying attention to AI from an epidemiological perspective this week, Sean? Well, I just, uh, you know, uh, it's funny, we dealt with blockchain quite a bit last year and the struggle with blockchain was uh, let's produce some real life in market situations where it's come to be. And it's, it's a struggle for that technology. I think in AI, we've seen one piece of evidence here clearly where it's like global potential epidemic hundreds of years ago would have killed millions and millions of people. AI is helping us detect it quickly and hopefully avoid that. Well, we'll be talking a lot about data and the changes in the availability of data and the ability to look at data. But one of the things that we are trying to do to set the stage, and the reason that this is one of our first webcasts of 2020, is that in looking at what our community of business leaders, especially corporate leaders who are trying to lead businesses to a stage of growth and figure out how to stay ahead of what's next, when we ask questions about what do you think is going to be one of the, late, the most important technologies of the next decade, it turns out that number one comes out artificial intelligence and that there are some subsets of that, AI and also machine learning and deep learning. And we'll talk a little bit about this with some of the experts today. Why is it so popular today? Why is it important? What are some myths? What's the dark side in terms of the fears and also We'll talk about ethics and responsible AI and all things AI. And um, hopefully the goal of this is to equip everyone with some knowledge to figure out what you need to do next and how to practically apply this to your company. So Sean, tell us a little bit about the top 10 use camps and where this slide comes from. Yeah, um, you know, commonly I, I talk to a lot of different C-suiters and you know, there's feel, there seems to be this feeling AI is just this one big black box that's going to help in the future, but really it's a lot of different things that play into the role that I think we're going to talk about on our webcast today. We actually asked in our corporate innovation playbook and, and another study that we did called the Digital Periscope last year, we asked people, what are the top 10 uses that you get out of AI? And, and this is what they came up with. And I won't go through all of them, but certainly we've seen some benefits around you know, a lot of things around job automation. But I think if you look at the top four, you're looking at a set of higher order benefits that potentially you can get out of artificial intelligence that not only help business, but also help humans get along with AI. Um, and so, um, yeah, we'll talk about some of these today. And we've had a fair number of conversations from the cynical, which is we're doing the same things, you know, stupider and stupider things faster and faster. And on the other side of that, we're doing cooler things that we couldn't have done without AI. And then of course, there's all the science fiction that always comes into these conversations. So we're really looking forward to hearing from people what some thoughts are. There are a couple of concepts. One is that you can send a question in chat and we'll, we'll try to address it in real time. We're excited for the people that are with us live as well as the people that listen to this in not real time. And also uh, the idea of what people think about in terms of AI? You know, what do, we, what do you really use it for? What's it for? So is it cool? Is it creepy? Is it helping us? Is it replacing us? All, all of the above. Sean, what are your thoughts to set the stage before we, we call in our first panelist? Well, it's, uh, I would only mention one stat. Uh, I think Oxford had a whole bunch of machine learners come together and say, okay, what does the future look like? And I think, um, I think they came up with the year 2147 that potentially every human job could be replaced by an algorithm or an AI. Um, so that's a very, even if that's dystopic or wondrous, um, I think people have different points of view. That's a very long period of time for AI to be sitting beside humans. And so I think one 
level that doesn't get enough uh, coverage in topics, and my hope is we cover it today in our webcast, is how do we work with AI as opposed to how does AI replace us or the ethics of AI or, or something like that? And so I think as innovators, that's increasingly going to be a question that people are asking. Well, so may the games begin. Let's bring on Kevin Suris. And what we've asked people to do is to say what they want all of us to know about them that's relevant to this context. So, Kevin, what, what should we know about you in the context of AI and the new dimension of innovation? You've got a, a long resume of uh, experience. Oh, oh, boy. You know, the, 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 the first uh, work I did in this field was uh, in the mid to late 90s, uh, inventing uh, and working on the very first uh, virtual assistant uh, called Portico at General Magic. We had about three or four million users on the system. It eventually uh, uh, became uh, part of General Motors' OnStar virtual advisor. So, um, in fact, all of what you see in Siri and other things today uh, actually originally had to license all of that IP. So, um, a lot of that work was done in the 90s, and then there was, you know, yet, a, yet another uh, cold winter of AI. And then, all of a sudden, around 2012, uh, for a lot of reasons, interest uh, uh, came back, and it's been uh, super exciting for the last uh, six to eight years. Well, I think it's really helpful to have you as first speaker because you do have such a great context and you do probably have a wide range of perspectives from the well, well, well informed and, ex and a lot of experience and also probably a, a, a bit of a, maybe some skepticism about some of the hype. So why don't you start us off with what it is? <laughs> what is well, AI? I'll give you my opinion. Everyone here will have their, their, their own opinion, so people will, will agree or disagree. Um, first of all, I open all my talks on AI, is that AI is actually a marketing term. Artificial intelligence is a great marketing term. It allows people to understand what it is we're trying to do. But actually, we are truly decades and decades and decades away from what people see in the movies as artificial intelligence. In fact, it might be... 100 years away, right? It's way, way harder than people think. And we don't have to have artificial intelligence. What we want is machine learning. That's the underlying technology, basically, that, that we're using. And, and that represents what people think is kind of, hey, that's artificially intelligent. It's really augmented intelligence. If you think about it, almost everything we do in AI today is to help other humans do their jobs better. I just came back from, a, from speaking at a, a, a security conference, uh, and not cybersecurity, but physical security just last week. And it was fascinating because um, they were touting the combination of, of uh, radar, so using radar to sense that there's movement on a property. You can put a radar on top of a building and see around the property, and then hone in on the camera where the movement is happening and then using AI looking at that image decide if it's a person or a bear and further process that to say if it's a person can we recognize a handgun or other kind of firearm on them that is amazing technology if you are a security person looking at those big screens with all of those things you know a hundred cameras flashing all of a sudden this comes into center and warns you that they have an AR-15 that is augmenting your entire job. It didn't eliminate it, but it augmented your job and made you safer and made the whole campus safer. So let me jump into that before we get dystopic, obviously. Um, with, <laughs> so what's changed? Like, what's, what, what is one of the big advances from a technological perspective that's changed sure. to go into this new realm? Okay. A couple of things. Um, obviously, in 2012, uh, all of a sudden, we could do deep learning at a really deep level, right? So uh, you could build neural nets, you know, almost infinitely deep. And so people got very excited about that. So we now see image recognition that is amazing and facial recognition. In fact, we take these for granted, right? The facial recognition uh, uh, that Facebook does, we completely take for granted that it can, it, it can pick out um, you know, your mom's face from billions and billions of other faces. That's wacky. And, uh, uh, but it isn't. It's totally doable today. So just like recognizing a handgun or recognize a bear from a person or, or whatever. But notice that these are very, very verticalized. These are very specialized vertical uh, problem solves, uh, if, if you will. And that's what we're good at. Now, I think that the other thing that's changed that people don't give enough credit to is cloud. Because it used to be if I wanted that compute horsepower and I'm not Facebook, I would have to go buy, let's, let's say I need um, 64,000 CPU cores or GPU cores, whatever I'm doing, right? And it, I would have to build that system. It would cost me whatever, two or three or four million dollars of hardware, and I'd have to maintain it, et cetera. Well, now I can borrow it for an hour and literally get 64,000, well, I'll give you CPU cores at AWS, 64,000 CPU cores for an hour is about um, $1,000, 
$1,000. For $1,000, I get all the compute horsepower that I needed for that hour, and maybe that's all I needed it for was an hour or two or three. So I'm not putting out that $4 million. So I think that that has allowed startup after startup after startup to say, I can do this without a huge investment up front of hardware. I can go borrow GPU or CPU that I couldn't do before. That is a huge difference. And I would argue none of these startups could have done any of this without the cloud being available because the upfront cost would have been uh, simply too high. So between new algorithms that are valuable, not all the time, but sometimes, and our cloud availability, it's, uh, it's fantastic. One other thing, of course, all of this database availability, you know, Google just made available to search some, I think, 24 million different databases, right? Really crazy number. Uh, the quality of the data is, you know, that's a whole different conversation. But we also have more access to data. And uh, in machine learning, you know, the, the term learning means it has to learn from something in order to predict something else in the future. You better have something to learn from. And some of that data is going to be noisy and better, and etc. So all of those are, are, are leading us in the right direction. So I know that you'll be doing a, this is a, a slight commercial for advanced.ai uh, in our next webcast, which is later today if people want to do it live, so that we'll actually see a walkthrough of, some, of an example. I, I think that it might be interesting to have you address a couple of, um, first of all, talk about what that's going to be like, but also maybe pick one of the audience questions. Uh, does either of these float your boat? How does uh, AI change operating systems or what data streams does AI capture? Either well, well, yeah, let me, let me, let me answer, uh, answer that. You know, AI changes every operating system, but it depends on how you mean it, right? Does Windows change or Linux change? Not, not, maybe not particularly exactly, doesn't have to, not particularly exactly. Could there be a whole new operating system? This is the, the va vagarity of the question, I guess. A whole new operating system that leverages AI? Of course, that could happen. And then there's the operating system of how we operate, which is maybe how they meant, not the physical operating system. Um, and, and of course, how we operate as a company like, um, you know, Advanced AI automatically tests software. The idea is to automatically, can we automatically find bugs in software? using some level of machine learning? The answer is yes, uh, I'll give you that hint. But, but that changes how we operate. The bigger change I will tell you is this, and everybody's seeing this. You have teams that, that want to use AI, but how do they know they can trust it? And that is one of the big roadblocks that we see. Well, it look, wow, look at all that data. Wow, you found lots of bugs, you found this, or you did this, you did that. How do we know we can trust it? Well, that's a hard question to answer. Right? It's like, how do you know you can trust a car when you get in it that the wheels will turn? Well, because they've been around 100 years and we know the wheels turn, right? We've gotten used to it. But on day one, when it replaced the horse and buggy, maybe people weren't so sure the wheels would turn or that it wouldn't explode, right? That's where we are in a lot of AI. People are a little freaked by it. And, um, and so that's one of the challenges I think all of us uh, uh, face today is building confidence in the users that, in fact, this is a really good thing for you to augment what you do. Well, we'll look forward to the AppVance demo in the, net, in the next webcast, as well as some other conversation later in this one. But it's a perfect segue into, Sean, you want to have a conversation with Natana Sharma? I would love to. Uh, I've been reading Natana's uh, bio all day today. Um, she's uh, got an illustrious history. She's general counsel for Labelbox, which is a really interesting company where, that we're also going to profile uh, about an hour and a half from now uh, in our demonstration kind of uh, chat today. But um, I think it is a good leapfrog from what Kevin was talking about, because I think even wincingly, Kevin talked about how oh, there's great algorithms and now it's the cloud. But Disappointingly, sometimes our data isn't in all the right sets for us to actually play with it. Um, and maybe today, Natana, I'd, I'd probably start there. But first of all, welcome. And secondly, I know your company deals with this issue. Um, talk to me about data and AI. Well, really great to be here. And I think that, uh, you know, AI is a really challenging buzzword. Um, it's something that we talk about a lot. It brings up thoughts of maybe SkyMed and science fiction and this question of what will happen to humans. And so, you know, I find it really helpful to step back and um, ask about what is the AI or machine learning that's happening in industry today and what's required to really get on the train and start developing some AI, what does that mean? And it really does come down to the data. So if we, if we think about what happened with the software revolution, the success of companies like GitHub and GitLab shows that we need tools to help us edit and manage code. 
if you're going to have a couple hundred software engineers working together on a system, they need tools to edit and manage their code to deploy the software that we all use today. And with machine learning, we're kind of in a situation where we were with software in the early 90s or maybe even a little earlier, where it's only first starting to be professionalized. A lot of the people um, with expertise in machine learning are PhDs who are very academic. And there's really this need for tools to help to manage, edit, and annotate training data. And training data is really at the heart of machine learning because if you want to um, create a machine learning algorithm or a model that can make predictions for you, a computer that can start to understand the world, well, you need to teach that computer. And how do you teach your algorithm? You teach the algorithm by annotating data so that the algorithm can recognize the features in that data that are important um, for getting results. And so that's really what we're focused on at Labelbox, supporting a wide range of players from large Fortune 500s to small cutting edge startups to have the tools and software that they need to manage that training data. It's funny, I, I was on your website uh, yesterday and um, most companies don't really do a good job of, uh, these are the industries and companies we play with. They, I never get a sense of what actually they're doing. Your, your page of label box was quite exciting. I was like, oh my Lord, you're the people behind that weed detection company that uh, understand that's a weed, not a plant and pull it out. So uh, maybe talk to me about the range of different industries where, you know, proper kind of, I guess, what would you call it? Cleansing and understanding of data uh, is helpful. So uh, at Labelbox, we're um, very focused on computer vision. So one of, the diff one of the things to remember about human intelligence is that we can see, we can hear, we can speak, we can read. Um, when it comes to artificial intelligence, we're teaching computers to do all those different things. Um, and at Labelbox, you can use our software for a wide array of kinds of intelligence, but we're hyper-focused on that computer vision. And so that's not just self-driving cars. Now, a self-driving car needs to be able to, quote unquote, see the environment to be able to navigate it. Um, but what are the other things that you can see that can be helpful? So there's all kinds of medical applications. Um, there's all kinds of applications for uh, all R&D, there's um, QA on factory floors, there's retail, so that stores can know, well, what are on our shelves, how long are people spending on these various shelves. Any place where you would have a human make decision based on what they see, you can actually build an algorithm to support that human. And so I do think it's just staggering the range of companies that we're seeing that can benefit from AI. And it's everything from pharma to agriculture technology to retail to biotech and on and on. Um, but I do want to flag that a key piece for success is access to a proprietary data stream. And so one of the things that is an incredible advantage for industry players who are um, established companies that might not think of themselves as at the cutting edge of AI is those established companies have proprietary data streams. And the challenge for a startup is to get access to data. And so the other piece that you want to ask when you're thinking about AI, evaluating an AI company is really drill down on where are you getting your data? Where's your data coming from? Yeah. Um, and associated with that, I think, um, you know, I would say it's probably a top three popular media headline around AI in terms of the bias and ethics around that data. Uh, I don't think any machine learner, data scientist, designer goes into it being malicious about, yes, I want to be, show my racist uh, or sexist or whatever undertones, but um, I'm not too sure where you want to take the bias and ethical approach to data, but um, do you have uh, observations or, or thoughts or conclusions about that? So I think that we are living in a time where we have a new tool. Um, the, the idea that you can upload a photo to Facebook and Facebook knows who you are, and maybe not just Facebook, but police or various other folks can just, you know, take a photo and, and know so much about you, that's a new development. And so I think as a society, um, as a legal system, we're struggling with how do we catch up with that? How do we get the benefits of this new technology, which, you know, as you pointed out at the beginning of the podcast, can help to alert us of disease early, um, which has an incredible benefit. How do we, how do we um, 
also make sure that we are aware of, acknowledge, and control for some of the potential negative externalities of this new technology, this new way of interacting with each other, um, this new value of data. Many consumers might be sharing their data and not understanding the way that that data might then be used to target them with advertisements, for example. And so we're really struggling with how do we manage that as a society? And I think the other challenge is that we're in a global world. And so if we make certain choices, but other countries, regions make different choices, we might find ourselves losing the AI arm race, arms race. And so that also um, introduces a challenging dimension. The, the thing I feel really proud of about Labelbox is that we provide an opportunity for companies to have a system of record of what data is actually training their algorithms and how is that data being annotated. And once you've got that system of record, you can actually test your algorithms for all kinds of bias and flaws and then go back and add in additional data and potentially even change how you annotate that data to result in less biased algorithms. And so I think that what we really do need to be reflective on is whether or not you use Labelbox, although of course I obviously think you should, how are you setting up systems so that when you build AI, you can create, you can fix problems when they happen? Um, how do you know what has gone into training your algorithm and how do you make your algorithm better? Because we also have to remember that we're comparing a world that uses AI to our current biased world. And so it's not as if we live in a utopia where there's no bias and starting to build AI introduces bias. Our AI is just a reflection of us. And just as a mirror gives us an opportunity to tweak what we put in front of that mirror, um, AI actually gives us, gives us an opportunity to even create a more just world. We need a really good hall monitor for the hall monitors, right? Um, <laughs> is that what we're saying? Um, the one the last thing before we pivot to our next uh, panelist, um, just quickly, you know, uh, there's only about, uh, my stat was about only 14% of the companies out there doing anything in depth around AI. So most of us are still at early stages here. Anything for the CEO or the C-suite, just quickies in terms of things that they should be thinking about as they uh, consider this technology driving their business forward? So just as, as Kevin said in the last um, panel, one of the remarkable things about AI is how much cheaper it's getting to actually develop an AI program and how much easier it is than you think. And so what I would say is experiment early, experiment often, and um, one key thing is to start to learn about the kinds of questions that AI can answer. So there are some questions that are gonna be really, really difficult for AI to answer, um, but then other questions are gonna be much easier. And so you can start educating yourself to understand, hey, what questions can AI, AI answer? How do I find one with high ROI in my business? and then throw some resources at getting some small wins that will really make that flywheel of investing in AI successful for my company. Very cool. And we're going to see a live demonstration of your product later today. So um, I'm excited about that. So um, thank you, Natana. I'm going to pitch it back over to uh, Andrea here for our next panelist, I believe. Great. Well, this is a great segue, actually, because we talked about PhDs. Um, Charles is one. And I also think that it's wonderful to welcome Charles Jans Jankowski. And he calls himself a conversational systems expert. So looking forward to a very systematic conversation with you, Charles. Great. Thank you, Andrea. Um, um, so, so I was going to say, first of all, let, let's set you up with the fact that you've been at this a long time in terms of context. And I also think that to, to put some framing into this. You come from both a PhD as well as a lot of um, corporate and, and applied experience. So would you mind starting off with just that, just since Natana talked about this a little bit, you know, like the notion of the academic world of AI and the practical application of AI. How, how, what have you seen over the years in your, in your background? Sure, absolutely. Thanks, and it's great to be here. So, um, so yeah, early on, I started kind of, as you mentioned, in, in university, kind of working on, <clears throat> you know, signal processing for speech recognition and, and that kind of thing um, um, at MIT. And then kind of, as the years went on, kind of did more also working with actually how do we deploy AI, working with uh, clients and users who are actually, who actually wanted to deploy these conversational technologies and, um, and that sort of thing. And it's definitely, you know, and I see on your slide here, you know, AI has definitely, you know, improved conversational systems to the point where you can actually imagine having meaningful conversations uh, with these systems, whereas kind of, let's say, even like 
10 years ago is more difficult. And I'll talk a little bit about in one of the, my first slides, I'll talk a little bit about kind of where we've been and, and, and that kind of thing. And, and some of the things that you might not have thought about as AI, but really are, if you look at it, AI, you know, for, you know, and, um, but, you know, there's been just very kind of, uh, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about deep learning and that kind of thing. Uh, and that definitely has made big inroads. Um, and then like to uh, Natana's point, um, data has been humongous. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, without the data, you can't do any of this stuff. And, and, we got to a point now where people actually would put systems out there. Like, for example, I don't know if you got, if, if folks remember, uh, Google had like a 411 application several years ago. That was basically put out there to collect data. And now, of course, you know, they have like reams and reams of data. I see papers at conferences where they train their algorithms on like 50,000, 100,000 hours of speech. And that's, that's insane. How do you get 100,000 hours of speech? Well, that's because they, you know, they have all this data, you know, so. That's great. And let me ask you the, la the final tee up before we go into this, the, the detailed slides. So in, in framing what you're about to talk about, since we have a, an, uh, a community of practitioners yep. who are probably, some, some might have PhDs in, in, in engineering or in systems, but a lot of people don't. What right. do you think in terms of today's leader, just someone in a, in a mid-sized company, a scale up, yep. a corporation, what do you think people really need to do first and second to say, yeah, I'm chipping away at, at, at AI in a way that will help me grow my company? Sure. Um, so I think on the technical side, I actually think like things are pretty well covered because as you say, there's so many people who know how to do this stuff. And with, as we've talked about, you know, access to data, access to the cloud and, and, and uh, all these things, uh, the technical stuff is actually pretty well covered if you know someone who knows what they're doing. Um, the one thing I would say that you don't hear as much about is um, focus on who's using your, your system. If you're doing conversation, focus on who's using uh, your AI, uh, you know, focus on the user. Um, and, and the reason is because, I mean, we're, you know, you want to have a conversation with someone. This is, the conversation is definitely an area where we're not talking about replacing humans. We're talking about working with humans. I mean, we're talking about how do humans, literally, how do humans interact with AI? So, uh, you know, focus on your user as, as, as kind of a, a thing I would stress that not everyone might, you know, think is, is so obvious. Well, because we have a, a community that's so interested in, in knowledge before they make decisions, I would love it if you talk a bit about where we've been. Sure, absolutely. So if you see on this slide, so uh, I couldn't I couldn't resist. I was I was watching it uh, recently. Uh, I, don't, I don't know who on this uh, webcast remembers the, the movie War Games from 1983, uh, where you had that uh, like you know can we play a game? You know that that was kind of like that can really kind of bad text to speech. But the people have been doing this for so long, kind of remember that sort of fondly as like as like wow that that was you know, nowadays we have text to speech where you can kind of barely you know know whether it's a human or or machine, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then kind of in the, in the 90s and, uh, you, you know, even starting in the 80s and the, and the 90s, and this is where I did a lot of work in, in the 90s, is you have the, um, uh, the phone systems, you know, and, and the reason, you know, I put a picture on there of um, uh, a woman screaming at the phone uh, because what you got a lot in that time period, especially when those systems first came out, was, you know, frustration. Um, you, ha you know you've achieved, for, you know, like cult status when Saturday Night Live does parodies of what you're doing. You know? so <laughs> they had parodies of the, of, the, of the phone systems. And I think there was one on Seinfeld as well for the, the movie phone system and all that kind of stuff. So there was, I mean, there was a huge kind of business benefit. And, and again, to call, some people wouldn't call we call the term for this IVR interactive voice response. Some people wouldn't call that AI, but it absolutely is AI. I mean, and to someone else's point, I think it was Kevin who said, mentioned this has been around for a long time. I mean, um, there's been a big push and, and a lot of progress in the last 10 years, but this stuff has been around for a long, we've been having conversations with computers for a long time, but some, we just always haven't had very good conversations. Um, so IVR that's, that, that's been around for a while talking to your phone, you know, talking to your, 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 airline or your brokerage over the phone with AI. Um, and then kind of in the early OOs, you started seeing the explosion of, uh, of chat, you know, text messaging and chat, which from, the, from a conversational perspective is also, you know, it, definitely in that category, it's just a question of how are you getting the input? You know, is you, are you talking to your device or are you typing to your device? Um, uh, 
and, and of course, we all know now that you can't even walk down the street, you know, 10 feet without seeing someone kind of with their head literally buried in their phone texting something to someone. Um, and then in the, in, the, in, the, in the 2010s, you've seen like, you know, uh, a lot of different, a lot of progress. Kind of in the mid 2010s, you had a couple of things. One is, of course, um, the Amazon Echo and the ubiquitous now Alexa and the equivalent uh, on the Google side, Google Home. You see these devices came out and, uh, um, you know, I doubt it was even, you know, fathomed that like they would be so, so popular. So now you see them in so many people's homes and so many people have these devices. Um, and then also, uh, some of you may have seen on, on the on the uh, kind of above the arrow kind of um, uh, that little robot called that's called Pepper. Um, that also came out kind of in the mid tens, and um, that's from SoftBank Robotics. And um, you first started seeing these humanoid robots that were kind of like starting to be like you know hey how a different way of interacting with uh, with AI. And then I also kind of put in there uh, something you may have seen if you were at CES, you may have seen uh, Samsung's Neon, which is kind of, uh, you know, and, and kind of the latest example of kind of a, a digital human. So not a physical presence, but kind of a virtual presence on a screen. And I will talk a little bit more about like how those kind of virtual presences kind of fit in when we talk about, you know, how do you get more engaging conversations? Um, well, well, and, and as, as we transition to this, I mean, one of the things that's so interesting is um, that, that we're kind of on the cusp that that feeling and you and I talked about this a little bit before the panel the feeling of comfort you know like we we talked once about things like bi even biometrics or you know would you like to have a drone who looks just like your grandmother pick your children up at school you know right. to a certain extent that's the creepiest thing you could ever think about <laughs> but but uh, but then you know there are lots of places where the more realistic the more comforting you know yep. there's kind of that that you know, cool versus creepy right. aspect to that as well. And we're, and we're, you know, we're constantly pushing that boundary. Um, you know, some of you may have heard of this notion of what's called the uncanny valley, where as you get, <clears throat> as you get too close to uh, like human looking, but not quite there yet, it actually becomes extremely creepy. Uh, and, and, uh, and we were talking earlier, Andrea, about, you know, some, that, you know, there are folks out there who are making extremely human looking robots. And, um, in some places, like let's say in Japan, that may be like, you know, very, you know, very uh, embraced. I actually think in the US, most people would find that extremely creepy, which is why, for example, the Pepper robot is you know, very non-threatening. It's very kind of not quite, it's almost cartoonish. And that's kind of a lesson there. Again, thinking about your users is, you know, users may not be ready for something that kind of really mirrors, you know, actual humans that closely yet. They may, they may just not be prepared for that yet. Yeah, well, at the at the risk of giving everybody a PhD, let's cover the under the hood. <laughs> let's yeah, cover yeah. let's cover the under the hood in a way, you know, obviously from the practitioner's perspective. You know, what does all this mean to us? Yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get too much deep, too much gore here. Um, this is just kind of a high level of these are some of the parts of a conversational system. Um, you've got and, and if you follow the arrows around, you've got like your your speech to text, which is basically going from speech to words. And then you've got what we call natural language understanding, which then converts that to meaning. Like, what did the person mean? What do they want? Um, and then you've got what we call dialogue management, which is, okay, I, I know what they mean. Now, uh, what should I do about it? Um, and then you have what's called natural language generation, which is, okay, I know what I want to say to the person high level. Now, how do I put that into words? And then finally, your text-to-speech um, kind of makes that into sound that you can hear. Um, one of the key things I want to point out is that if you look at the it kind of roughly, if you go from left to right on this slide, uh, the problem gets harder. And I, I don't want to say that speech to text is an easy problem. This is actually the first thing that I worked on, and people have been working on it for 50 years, and it's an incredibly difficult problem, and it's required, like, so much work. Um, and But, you know, you've seen already that there's been significant improvements with, like, stuff on the left side, speech to text and text to speech with deep learning. Um, you know, if you, if you see, like, the performance of these lab systems around, like, the early, the early 10s, they made a significant, significant jump in performance when kind of deep learning came in. Uh, and then as you move to the right side, you go to the middle of natural language understanding, like what is the meaning? Uh, deep learning has, has had a lot of success. Um, when you go to the right side, which is dialogue management, um, the rule, uh, rules are still the way to go in that, in that space. So, I, you know, one of the things I would kind of point out is that 
Uh, there's still a lot of work to go to make what I want to call, and I'll talk more about engagement on the next slide, what I would call engaging conversational systems. And, uh, you know, and, you know, one example is there's a, there's a yearly competition called the Lebner Prize, where uh, some of you may have heard of the Turing test, which is kind of Alan Turing's famous, you know, like, when I can't tell if it's a computer or a person, then we'll know we've kind of achieved AI. Um, and there's this competition which sort of tries to mirror that. Um, you know, it has a bunch of chat bots that come in and, and you know, people try and tell, you know, if we can tell them apart from a human and no one's been able to do that yet, but they still give prizes for what's the best one out there. And the best one out there so far has always been rules-based. And I mean a lot of rules, like 10,000, 50,000, a lot of rules. Uh, so it's such a hard problem because it involves context. It involves kind of, you know, emotion and everything that, you know, AI isn't, isn't there yet. So uh, there's still a lot of work to go there. Well, and I, it's interesting because from, from just my own lifetime, and I, I, I really don't want to admit that I did see war games, so that sort of dates me. Um, <laughs> but I just remember in, the, in years ago when I worked in expert systems design, you know, at NASA, and, you know, you were trying to figure out the rules for how that expert did what they did so that if God forbid they died, you had a rule base around it. How could you simulate something? I remember to, to go back to what Kevin was saying, working with OnStar and realizing how comforted people felt if before GPS was available, you know, and we're, how comforted people felt with, I'm lost, you know, it's, it's raining, I can't get home, those types of things. And then the next one was, I remember working with a restaurant company, and they had this really cool program. The only problem was it would pick up like a word like cold, and they couldn't tell the difference between cold pizza and cold beer right. in, ter in terms of the intent. And then I remember in a telecom project we did, there was a whole sense of customer interaction where they could feel the anger you know, so they knew that someone was ticked off even before the words came out because right. they, could, they could sense it through the telephone. So, yeah. I mean, even in my own lifetime, I've, I've witnessed a lot of these from the company, from the corporate perspective. Right. So this is one where we're going to have to zip through a little bit of this, but I want you to get to this notion of engagement. Sure. We're always looking for metrics, and I thought it was really interesting for you to express um, what, what we, what's important and what people can do about that. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Um, so, yeah, and, uh, you know, along with a lot of these technologies, there's been some frustration, right? Especially we talked about the IBR systems and um, people wondering, like, hey, I've deployed this system, but why don't people seem like they're very happy with it? Um, and kind of one spectrum I like to look at is kind of moving from, let's say, texting, like text bots, like instant messaging to voice bots, I'll call which is your, your Google Homes and your Alexas and to some respect IVR, to like this notion of avatars and virtual humans all the way over to like actual physical robots. Um, and as you move along that spectrum, uh, you find that as you get closer to kind of mirroring human, human form factor, and you actually get what, you know, more what I call engagement, uh, where uh, more naturalness and, you know, the humans having like a more kind of real, human-like conversation with that with that device. So uh, we haven't had much experience with physical robots. The reason why I actually picked a different picture for Pepper on this slide is because you can see all the people kind of circled around and they're having a great, they're having a great old time. They're like smiling and laughing and great. You don't typically see that when you're talking to a phone system or whatever. I mean, people are frustrated. They're like, oh, I got to go through this tree of, of crap. It's terrible. And, but if you, if you do it well, and, and you kind of mirror human behavior, you can get very good engagement, but it's much harder to do that. And this is where the dialogue management comes in and all that kind of stuff. Um, so what I'm hoping we can do is whet everyone's appetite only because we've uh, committed to so many wonderful panelists in one session. I think that it's really important to think about the next wave and kind of what's coming. But before we talk about your final, your final thought, we want to let you provide our, uh, our community with this offer, because I think it was wonderful that, that, uh, that you, you've literally written the book on this. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I want, I want to make a, a quick plug to, uh, to check out uh, a book that my colleague and I are writing called Voice by Systems. And it talks a lot about how do you focus on the user and how do you kind of design these systems properly? How do you build great applications? I mean, like I said, the tech is pretty much there. 
Uh, but now we got to figure out, okay, how do we kind of layer on top of the tech good design so we build great applications? Uh, uh, today, as it turns out, um, our publisher, Manning, is, give, is offering 50% off all factors of this, of this book. Um, and then after today, you can use the code on this slide for to get 40% off. And then if you uh, see the email here, uh, if you're the first five folks to contact me, I can give you, actually give you a free book code. So uh, feel free to contact me and uh, you can check out kind of how to learn more about how to build these, these great apps. Well, I think this is super helpful historically. And thank you, Charles. I'm going to turn it back over to Sean. We have two more, two more panelists. The next one is Sean is going to lead an interview with Benjamin Levy. Before we get there, because uh, I know uh, with bated breath, uh, I'm going to listen to Ben. Uh, there was a question from one of our uh, uh, attendees who, uh, quickly for Charles, are there different conversation systems forming based on different languages? Do you have a good 20-second answer on that? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of work being done. So you have what we call the in the research community, high resource languages, you know, US, English. And, and again, going back to what Natana said, it's all about data. Where do we have data? Where have we collected data? Uh, there's a ton of work in, in also what we call kind of low resource languages, you know, languages we don't have a lot of data and a ton of research on how do you build these systems without needing all that data. So yeah, there's been a lot of progress in that. Good. Uh, we'll hear more, and uh, certainly if people are interested, there's a book coming out too, I hear. So, yep. um, going to move over to Ben uh, Levy right now. Uh, he's co-founder, general partner of Bootstrap Labs. Uh, you know, uh, what's the movie from where it's like, follow the money? Well, uh, this is the money, and I think um, certainly Ben's raised something on the order of $300 million for diff from different institutional investors principally for AI companies. He's a bit of a Pied Piper because you guys have conferences and a digest and a huge community of people interested in AI. Maybe scroll through the next three slides and then we'll back out to this one. Just, um, um, sorry, just one back. No, yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. And thanks right, for having more. me. Go back. One more. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Here? No, no worries. worries. Yeah. So I, listen, I, ben. Uh, thank you. I'd be very quick. I think there's been some great contents before me, so I think that we'll uh, fast forward uh, a lot of our sections. Um, look, quick background. You know, I, I'm the French kid that basically dreamed to go to America. Um, came in Silicon Valley 20 years ago. Started in investment banking world. Did a lot of MA transactions and a lot of private placements. Um, but they say, look, advisory is great, but ultimately building company is nothing like first-hand experience. So build two fintech companies. Actually, my first exposure to machine learning and AI was in in uh, not as early as as, as Kevin, but uh, we did that in, uh, in early 2000, and frankly, 20 years ago, we were doing the very same thing people are doing today. It was just a lot slower, but it did work. Um, yeah, you think about venture firm, you know, this is Bootstrap Labs, an early stage venture capital firm. We were started about 12 years ago. Uh, what's pretty unique about us is one, we're very focused on the early stages when there's a lot of, um, you know, decisions being made to really start figuring out where you go, how you deliver value to the market, and, and um, you need a lot more expertise and access to knowledge um, than just capital early on, as we heard. The cost of building technology companies has gone to the floor and that's creating incredible opportunity for um, you know, investors and entrepreneurs alike to, to do a lot with a lot less. Uh, four years ago, we saw the writings on the wall as we were investing in software, means proprietary data. Uh, we started to see software that's like using machine learning, uh, machine vision technology, natural language understanding, and say, look, software is no longer gonna be um, using that data as just a recipient is actually gonna start learning from it and giving more of a you know, lean back experience to the user where he's gonna start making um, some informed decision or help to make decisions. So for us, it was a clear view that, hey, AI, you know, venture capital is about investing what's next, what's next was AI. AI, to your point, was too generic. Uh, it had to be applied. It had to be very narrowly focused uh, to deliver value. And so for the last four years, we've been the first VC firm exclusively dedicated to investing in applied AI technology companies uh, we have made 24 investments in the space, um, probably one of the most active investors in that space. We have a lead position when it comes to seed, and we tend to follow on into Series A. And then we look at most you know, interesting verticals for us, which are enterprise, industrial, health, finance, energy, mobility. I mean, I could look at your first slide today and say, look, all these verticals and all these technology that will be the future, uh, each and every one of them is impacted by AI somehow. So it's really touching everything. When you're a venture capitalist, you're in the business of selling money for equity. And trust me, everybody's money feels or looks the same. And so VC firms have looked really hard to differentiate themselves. And early on, to work with the very best founders, you need to set yourself apart. And the way we did this is by bringing the community together, to have a reputation of being super supportive to our founders and having access to a lot of knowledge so that we can really help them execute more successfully 
um, and then try to build a methodology so that I like to say, let's help our founders make original mistakes, not the mistake that everyone else has made before them. Um, so the last slide is ultimately speaking a little bit about the community. For oh. us, four years ago, believe it or not, uh, the next slide actually. Oh, sorry, yep. Um, it's about leading the conversation. You know, it's, it's 65 years into the making, but there's a lot of changes. And you want to bring the community together. In 2016, no one was really bringing the community together. So today we have about 40,000 people. Uh, we do annual conferences with 5,600 people. It's all thought leadership, being very transparent about what's working, what's not working, um, and bringing some of the top players in the industry, uh, really for thought leadership. And then every quarter we invite people in. It's about having a conversation. It's a transverse, you know, transformational technology, have a massive impact for society, uh, corporations, and people. And I think we can't do that in a silo. We can't do that in a vacuum. We need to bring the information forth um, and do it transparently. So just uh, as Andrew maybe backs up to the three slides, to the original slide, um, this wasn't always the case with Bootstrap. Um, you guys uh, have been around since 2008, but you actually pivoted to be exclusively um, kind of applied AI focus. Um, what happened in the market or the technosphere that made you go, yeah, we have to be 100% committed to this space? Yeah, so I, I wouldn't call it a pivot as much as an evolution, right? If you think about, you know, Andreessen said software is the world and we totally subscribe to this. And ultimately, if you have proprietary data, you can build a mod around your business to make it unique. Everybody can, complete, you know, replicate your software, but it can't replicate your data. Um, and so for us, it was just an evolution to say, look, AI is actually eating software. Um, it's really happening everywhere. And your ability to drive unfair advantage in solving problems in a way that wouldn't be solvable before and drive a lot of value for your customers was getting pretty clear in 2016. So uh, we made the bet to really raise our next funds exclusively focused in the space. And I think since then, uh, we're not looking back. And I think the timing was very opportune, obviously. Um, and it's been an incredible several years. And I think reminding people on this panel, we're still very early in this game. I think, you know, it is very early and we see the corporations struggling mightily, you know, still dealing with quote unquote digital transformation and now they are getting hit with this AI wave and frankly, they are nowhere near equipped um, to, to negotiate the term. Maybe we'll go there actually, Ben, like um, you're a C-suiter, CIO, CMO, CSO, CEO. Um, there's a struggle, I guess. I mean, just to get anything done in a corporation takes a longer period of time than a startup. Um, are you seeing headway of amongst your companies that deal with corporates of, of um, starting to implement some of the stuff inside corporations? Yeah, so we have a pretty incredible success rate from C to Series A, which means our companies are doing really well and not just because they're building some cool stuff, but actually because they're getting traction and revenue. Um, so I think the corporate world is definitely spending money to start adopting this technology. And when you start looking at the front, I mean, we're talking $13 trillion of wealth creation in the five to 10 years. You're looking at a 30 to 40% potential profitability improvement for corporations that adopt it before their competitors. And then ultimately it's about for them thinking about their core business and say, how do I launch my core product, my core service enabled with AI technology? And that is, you know, really fighting two wars. Uh, one to adopt outside innovation faster. A second one, which is to generate innovation faster that embeds their core product with AI. And I think this is a mighty battle. That's why corporations are coming to us for help invest in our funds, they have their own venture capital fund, they need to start looking at making acquisition faster, test faster. We heard Natana earlier, I think it's great to say, look, you got to try fast, you got to try early, uh, you'd not be afraid to fail because, you know, your company's in the balance. Now, I think uh, the advantage you have as being kind of a, an investor of a broad spectrum of these type of companies is you probably see patterns, right? You uh, we see do. The, the landscape, you can actually see where the trends are, where things are going. Um, what's helping AI, what's hurting AI in terms of what you're seeing um, trend-wise? Yeah, I think Kevin said something great earlier. Look, it's about building trust, right? We're in the early days and I think, you know, in the past, the AI winter was triggered by the fact that nobody could really explain it, nobody could really trust it. Uh, the variance maybe was too big, you know, can replicate some of the great things you read about the PhD research uh, with another set of data. Um, so we are getting there. I think that's the good news. I think we're doing that more transparently. We're aware of it. Uh, the granularity of the data allows us to do a better job. Uh, all the service providers, all the tools out there are really helping also accelerate the adoption. Um, so to me, it's like not a matter of, of really when, but you know, it's not a matter of if, but when. Um, and it's happening. It's happening really today. It's already delivering multi-million dollar ROI to companies that are adopting it. And we're seeing the, you know, platforms companies. So, you know, what you're going to see actually is the rise of chief ethic officers in corporations. You're going to need to start asking yourself, 
what are you optimizing your algorithm against? And what, is the, the, what are the value sets that are using behind that? Are you optimizing for dollars? And we saw where that brought Facebook. Are you optimizing for clicks? And we saw where that led Amazon. Um, or, and so what are really um, these functions that you're optimizing for? And what are the constraints and the reward system you're building into these algorithms? Um, and, and I think that what I also like, and I use that often, and say, look, you know, AI is nothing but a tool in some ways. And, and we're training it with the data that we have. And I, we look at the mirror and we don't like the image in the mirror. Yes, society is raci racist and biased and, and, and we have to face that, but the opportunity is now we can correct it. We actually can no longer claim ignorance. We are aware of it and we can fix it. Uh, last question before we move on, just a, a quick answer if I could. The, you've got a company, let's say it's 50,000 person company and they're just getting into AI. And we talked in our last webcast about edge organizations inside big companies or the full company in, in entirety. Um, what's the best way to get AI started inside of a, a corporation? Right, so multidimensional problem, but one, it needs to come from the top leadership and vision and set the right culture inside the organization. So don't be afraid to strive, don't be afraid to fail. Uh, so long as you learn from your failures, you know, that's fine. Um, you need to really have long-term commitment of capital. You can't just say, hey, here's a million dollars and next year it's cut in half. I mean, you need to be persistent long-term with your commitment to capital and to doing this. Um, you know, so question is, is it 10% of your market cap? I mean, don't start throwing me like a million dollars, five million dollars. Look in terms of percentage of your market capitalization. Are you willing to invest that in order to transform your company and stay relevant in the next 30 years? Because most companies are failing and dropping the S&P 500 faster than ever before. Uh, it's no surprise. Um, and then you need to start really asking yourself the 80, 20 questions. What are the, you know, 20% of the areas where I can generate 80% of the outcome? So I like Danny Lang, you know, he's a friend and investor with us. And he, he always says, look, big data, big problem. <laughs> Start with small data, uh, <laughs> focus on areas that are valuable um, and, 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 and simple machine learning, sometimes not complicated deep neural networks might help you solve some of the problems that ultimately for you as a corporation will generate a lot of ROI. And one hey, of the hey. things... One of the things that we do at the end is we let everyone do like a very kind of quick go around. So after we hear from Alex, it would be great if everyone had a really quick either, you know, just like a 20 second insight or aha or something you'd like as to people to leave people with as a takeaway. Because um, it will go, we'll let everyone on the panel kind of have one last weigh in about something that they heard that was interesting or something you'd like our audience to hear about. And with that, I'd like to introduce Alex Sato, and uh, we would like to now talk about something really interesting uh, also to build on what we've learned so far. We're looking at a global perspective. Um, we're looking at talent and learning and how people get access to this wonderful world of AI uh, and what it really means in terms of the policy and the ecosystem. So welcome, Alex. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, a little bit about your background so that you can tell us who you're representing today. And we've got some slides to share that I think will be really interesting for a non-Silicon Valley, but also sort of Silicon Valley perspective on, uh, on this whole dimension of innovation. So uh, Alex, give us a background in terms of who you're representing today. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. In fact, before I do that, I would say I'm very excited about uh, Bootstrap Labs and Ben Levy. And they really represent uh, uh, what we would like to be in the future Alliance for AI. Uh, and so we'll keep watching and, and learning from, uh, you know, how you grow, Ben. That's pretty great. Uh, so, so yes, like Andrea said, Alexander Sado, uh, I, uh, a number of the panelists had mentioned earlier on the importance of NVIDIA GPUs and the cloud to democratizing access to this, uh, you know, to this technology, artificial intelligence that innovators use around the world. Uh, as a uh, you know, one of the members of the product team at Nvidia a while back, I uh, was responsible for actually running market strategy for every single GPU deployed on a major cloud today, uh, be it in America or in in, in, Asia, in China, and so that really did provide me unique uh, background and context into how uh, most of the organizations around the world are using the technology, and it's been uh, truly exciting the, the potential and the possibilities. Uh, and so, um, you know, so just seeing what that could do for the rest of the world, I uh, decided to also create an opportunity to do that in Africa uh, through an organization and an NGO, uh, Alliance for AI. And um, uh, even before this, I'd spent a good uh, amount of time working across the five, at least five different countries in Africa from the North, East, West, South. 
uh, that, you know, provided me an opportunity to, uh, uh, you know, appreciate the difficulties or challenges of doing business in Africa, but at the same time, identify the unique opportunities and sparks that can uh, be, be invested in that could help, you know, change the, uh, turn the fate of the continent around. Um, so, and so talking about why we do what we do, uh, by most projections, especially like the Bill Gates Foundations, uh, Africa is heading towards a place of extreme poverty, right? Uh, which is a dire problem for the world, given that uh, Africa has the world's youngest population and most other places of the world have aging population. Uh, so on the one hand, you could throw billions of dollars at this challenge. Uh, but on the other hand, like we're doing, uh, you can go to the whiteboard and uh, try to be creative uh, until someone decides to give you a billion dollars, which I'm waiting for. <laughs> uh, so we are working to turn Africa's fate around uh, with an approach to activate Africa's most impressive innovators with the sharpest tools. Uh, and there's no tool sharper today than, oh. than AI. Uh, th there are over 10,000 Africans today who are benefiting from our work, either directly or indirectly through our continental partner network. Uh, what we do, as this, uh, the previous slides do oh, show, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we strive to create successful businesses to hire this Africa's exploding number of young people. You can see it's 42% of the youth in the world by 2030 would be African. Uh, we also strive to solve some of the main critical problems that affect uh, the frontier markets in Africa, like healthcare, agri, and finance. And uh, we want to apply all of this to build AI solutions that apply to the rest of the world as well you know given the complexity of the African conditions and data sets and, and skills and so so, mm -hmm. so so I'll say one quick thing um, to insert here which is that the the prior part of our conversation was partly about technology partly about large corporations partly about Silicon Valley partly about the world in general but this is really interesting because we're looking at educating, equipping the next generation to be to have the skills and the tools so that this gap, because you can imagine a gulf of, uh, of skills difference really being magnified over the next 10 to 20 years if you don't start somewhere. Is that, is that right? Yes, yes, definitely. That's the peril side of the AI. <laughs> AI represents a peril and an opportunity. Uh, and, and so do many of the technologies of this fourth industrial revolution. You see, it's, this is a global challenge where across the world, uh, technology is progressing a lot faster than education or policy is keeping up. Uh, and so if we allow this to continue, uh, you know, this will progress towards a, a, a place where we're increasing the gap uh, economic, of economic conditions. And this very naturally leads to unrest. So we need to, we need to uh, curb that gap. Uh, if we're still kind of, Look through aside just for a second. Yeah. Uh, what last thing I'll say here is, you know, in America and some parts of the world, we're using online learning platforms like Coursera and Udemy, and they're helping. Um, but the assumption there is that the internet is close to being free, which is not the case in most frontier markets. And so solutions there have to be designed uh, to be more accessible. And so we can go over to the um, next slide. And um, uh, well, before these show up, uh, I'll talk about the opportunity of AI in, in frontier markets in Africa. You see, for, for it's about solving problems. For anyone or government trying to solve basic uh, or provide basic amenities like food and water, I'm sure you'd love to succeed with the resources that you have. Uh, I mean, for example, governments probably have limited uh, quantities of fertilizers but, and want to distribute it uh, appropriately or they don't have enough doctors to get to remote areas and, and could use some help or some tools to, to reach there. Or as a company, you just have a limited marketing budget. So you want to be able to advertise to the perfect customer. That is exactly what AI is a perfect tool for. And, and I think no other continent needs this more than Africa, given that some estimates say, you know, a hundred billion dollars is, is the infrastructure gap that needs to be spent on every, every year. And so, so, every, mm -hmm. so I'll interrupt just for a second, only because um, we always have more ambition than time. 
Um, I'm going to ask you to summarize this because I think that these three pillars are really important and yeah. we're hoping that we can get people to be interested enough in Alliance for AI that they'll reach out to you as well and, and get a, a deeper conversation. So it's certainly, it's not that we're not interested, of course, but, mm -hmm. but it's because I think that these pillars are important, first of all, in terms of how you're thinking about entering these front, this frontier market and mm -hmm. also for the way that you're creating a model and a community that can be replicated elsewhere that, isn't, that, you know, that, that needs to have access as well. Yes, exactly. We are trying to build an authentic viral community here where we're ensuring people are learning, Africa's people in Africa or outside the continent that they are learning uh, the appropriate materials to become leaders with this technology and that they're getting positioned uh, to, to innovate and solve problems with, with this uh, you know, technology. And then finally, they are in environments that allow them to flourish, right? So that's where we talk about policy. We have a number of programs in these spaces. I have to scroll back a little bit oh, as well. sorry. Yeah, we yep. have, so this is where I actually interest everyone on the panel and people watching. If you, we welcome you to invest your time, your money, your advice uh, to work on some of these programs. The, the top ones here on the side of learning, we can build packets or material to send to every coding school in Africa. That could be incredible. Or you can decide to support investing in creating virtual AI clinics for every accelerator to reach every startup in Africa. That's a huge problem that we can solve. Or we, on side of policy, we're very excited about our AI readiness index tool that can help governments across each country measure where they stand and think about what's the return on different investments. That could be incredible and uh, welcome you to reach out and talk about any of this. And the only reason I'm advancing is because of the time, but we actually think that you've nailed it in terms of learning, innovation, and policy, no matter what country, right? Because mm -hmm. that's the way that any, any corporation can develop a readiness to really compete, whether it's, it's not just for a frontier uh, community, it can also be a corporate community that doesn't have any capacity right now to think about those three. So would yep. you mind, you know, we hate to do this, but just kind of summarize a little bit and then we want to make sure that you can tell us how we can get in touch with you on your next slide as well oh yes definitely this just speaks about you know some organizations who've used our, our platform and and so you could just read through and talk about those but we're seeing enough we're seeing a lot of of, of exciting progress on the continent and literally just uh we we are serving as that pan-african voice in this space of global ai being able to tell this story to the rest of the world. So it starts to uh, be able to uh, easily identify uh, where it would like to invest. And so welcome you to go on our platform, Alliance for AI, learn about everything AI in Africa. You can follow the newsletter, follow us on social media, or, or just read about some of the success stories on our platform and see if there are startups or training programs you want to connect with uh, and work with in the future. Well, so we also really, um, uh, like and appreciate the support that you're, you've been giving to our future proofing community, including uh, guest uh, presentations last summer, and we're really excited to connect with you in the future. We're going to do one quick anything that anybody wants to say before Sean and I wrap us up because we're always over uh, enthusiastic about how much content we can get through. Didn't know if Kevin wanted to say anything quick, Natana, Charles, Ben, Alex, just a, a sort of quick aha. Yeah, I'll say, I'll say something quickly uh, uh, because it was on the, the slide as a question and we never answered it, which, it, uh, which is, is AI coming for your job? Um, uh, the, the truth is, this is just my own uh, view, is that the U.S. anyway shed a lot of its sort of mundane, repeatable jobs, mostly to India and China over 20 plus years. I believe those are the first jobs that are at risk because those are the easiest things for us to completely replace with, with AI and machine learning today. So those are probably more at risk than jobs in the US uh, where we can retrain and upgrade people and things like that. That's two cents. Well, thanks and we loved what you said and, and we'll be posting a summary of this in the link as well pretty quickly for the community at large to hear as well. Uh, Natana, any last thoughts? Uh, I think just, um, I'd like to reiterate again how easy it is to just get started and the benefit of just getting started. So, um, you know, I think each of the panelists made great points about how to do that. But if you're listening to this and you don't yet have an AI program, start something. Great. Charles. Uh, don't just think about the technology. Think about your users. How's that? 
I like that. And I also like the theme of engagement. I thought that was a really interesting metric to, to think about. Ben? I would say seek the advice of people that are experts. And, and in, in nature, we talk about speed kills, but I think in, in corporate innovation, slowness kills too. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and Alex, any last thought? Yes, definitely. Try to ensure that your design Nine teams are, you know, inclusive and representative of your users because I think that's the easiest way to uh, eliminate some of the negative and parts of AI and the bias we spoke about earlier on. Well, this was an awesome panel. Thank you, panelists. And Sean and I are going to wrap this up, but uh, we really appreciate your time and your expertise. It was a, a really rich conversation with so much to talk about. So thank you very much. And Sean, do you want to take us through to the uh, the last part of the webcast? Yeah, I do. And, and there's a question about AI and tourism. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll answer Gemma's question offline here for the sake of time. Um, on the heels of Clayton Christensen uh, death this week and uh, his two great books, Innovators Solution and Innovator Dilemma, where we've produced a list uh, called FN99. It's the 99 books that have changed us. Some are tech, some are innovation. Uh, look for it on uh, futureproofingnext.com. Uh, um, we got our next two. We do two of these a month. Um, we're talking about our upcoming book. Um, it's coming out in February uh, at our next one. And as well, we're talking about scaling and growth later in February. And uh, I've posted it as a link in uh, the chat box if you're interested, but um, some of the people on this, uh, this webcast will be on a second version where we are getting into the weeds and actually doing demonstrations of different uh, AI in action. So if you're if this uh, round one intrigued you, then you'll love round two just as much. Great. Well, this was an amazing experience. Everyone's conversation was, it blended in well, and it also took us in different, different directions, really rich and well-informed. And I hope that we can all stay in touch and we can all be in touch with each other as well to, to keep the AI and the new dimension of innovation plus moving forward in all of our communities. So thank you very much to the really interesting panelists and great to see you again, Sean. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.